the meeting. What do you think about Greenberg? Any general thoughts or ideas, comments? Did you find it easy to read, hard to read, peculiar? <laughs> you laugh, so you have to answer that question. Well, I had to think out loud and kind of capture what you are trying. Did that, how, do, you, do you do that normally, or did you try that as a, because I suggested well, that. Well, I do it normally. Do you? If, okay. if it's not registering and I find myself blanking out on what I just read, then I yeah. Yeah, because it's it's a because I, I do it too. It's a strategy, and you know, if you're in public or something, people can't believe you find it. But, uh, but just sort of reading, did you feel like reading out loud helps? Try it to did make, help, but yeah. I was, it's still confusing to me. I guess the way you would word things and trying to answer your specific question mm -hmm. was like it was hard to draw out specifics mm -hmm. to answer those questions. So you just had to kind of guess on it. Try to figure, yeah, <laughs> try to make sense out of it. Anybody else want to respond to that? I just found myself reading the first paragraph like over and over again, like, all right, what, what direction is this going in? Yeah, yeah, I feel like, yeah, what is he going to say? Yeah, <laughs> because it seems a little sort of disjointed a little bit. He yeah. rambles a bit. Yeah, and There's it's like a, certain parts where he gets his point across, but then, like, as soon as he does that, he kind of just keeps digging and digging and digging and gets lost in its own words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the part of the reason for the questions is that uh, those are some key ideas in there. Um, but he does kind of, you, you sort of wonder where he's going at moments, you sort of wonder, well, you know, where, where is he going exactly? So we'll try to make sense out of that a little bit today and then also give you feedback in your questions. So based on what you, what you could figure out and based on what he says, you know, um, does he talk, what is the situation? What did you get a sense of in the situation at the moment? <laughs> Yeah, and it, which is, which I think, it, and part of the reason we're choosing this is because of that idea. Um, so we'll talk we'll talk about this idea of alienation for American artists, but also for um, European ones as well. I think it's on um, it's on the first you know copied page, but it's like page one ninety three, about midway down, a little past half midway. Um, he says the American artist has to embrace and content himself almost with isolation if he is to give the most honesty, seriousness, and ambition to his work. Isolation is, so to speak, the natural condition of art in America. And I think that's really interesting because I feel like people might say that today, you know, to a certain extent. Or would you agree with that? Do you feel like, you know, is, is art really big in the public eye? Is it valued in the public eye? I mean, those are some of the issues that we get with contemporary art. You know, I think of it in that respect, too. Challenging. <laughs> I think in America it's kind of covered up with commercialism. Mm -hmm. Like we're more about the commercial art now than we are uh, just con contemporary art. In right. Well, maybe, we, uh, maybe we tend to be concerned with the value of art. You know, when you see headlines, oftentimes it's about the Money. financial yeah. value yeah. The as opposed to the value. other kinds of intrinsic or other kinds of inherent. You know, values of art. Yeah, we, we don't, you know, you don't see the news article that's like, look at this fantastic piece for its value and how it makes you question it or mm -hmm. how it how it pushes an idea of the artist forward. It's more like, look at this piece, it's, it's worth reasons. billions of dollars. Right, yeah, that's what, that's what captures yeah. our attention. Yeah, can we read the gym? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I was just going to say, it kind of, to me, it seems like uh, contemporary art in America is just kind of. Like nobody considers it mm -hmm. really because you know, if you tell somebody, yeah, yeah, I'm an art major, they're like, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's another art major, then they're like, what do you do, right? Yeah. <laughs> or another artist or something so like that. Yeah. I think that you know, we're kind of looked down upon a little bit. Yeah, and, and in some ways that maybe it's a reflection of larger society. They like, only don't really, really understand. They only really push forward art majors if you say something like, I'm a graphic design major, then they're like. Because that's more of a business, that's more of a, a commercial art than it is. Or maybe it seems more concrete. Yeah. You know, maybe in some then ways. they're like, oh, you know, what company do you work for? Yeah. And then you're like, I made a few things on a banner outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, too, I think um, the, uh, yeah, so I think there's a kind of a, a reflection in some ways. So the dynamic that Greenberg is in is there's some similarities to our own time. 
But the other thing, too, is also consider that Greenberg's in a time frame that's just a few years after the end of World War II. So this is written in 1948, um, you know, the war is ending, um, you know, in 1945. So when he's talking about isolation, I think it's important to also consider that dynamic as well. So how might, how might America be different from European nations in terms of wartime? So that's a really broad, I don't that may be a bad question. Well, I mean, it think kinda, about the things about the geography, like world geography, right? It's, it makes sense yeah. because America in itself is an entirely different country. While, meanwhile, during the war front, you had you know five or six different countries that were on the same playing field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, were, literally, their yeah. playing field is there. I mean, the, the playing field is That's in their, their country. Room. Yeah, in their Whereas backyard. We're separate. So I saw a hand up over here too. Um, I mean, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. The fact that America was isolated, it also allowed for our economy to be boosted tremendously mm-hmm. because we didn't have to work towards rebuilding our own country. Mm-hmm. We benefited profit wise from being able to provide all these things to other countries, to ourselves during the war. Mm-hmm. Unlike many European countries where everything they put into the war, mm-hmm. it, went, it went straight into the war and they still had to rebuild. Yeah, and that's the thing if you think in, in 1948, that everything is just for the US is really just the I mean, post war is sort of gearing up. Like the effects of that dynamic are really going to be seen in the in the 1950s, the um, and especially with things like the GI Bill. So you've got soldiers, you know, coming back, um, you know, going to school. The economies, you know, kind of just running full steam. So in, in that time frame of a few years, you know, especially like I think three or four years, the time it takes to graduate with a, with a degree and people to kind of you know get resettled and um, kind of reacculturated in a way. Uh, that's why part of the reason why in the 50s everything just goes. You know, kind of barrels forward. You got, um, you know, uh, you know, got you know, large numbers, you know, significant numbers of Americans who are better educated. You know, industries, you know, kind of running full tilt. You know, the economy is good, and then you know, so you know, but so it's it's kind of happening. But I don't know that people are necessarily necessarily so fully aware of that dynamic quite yet. It's kind of right on the, you know, right on the, the cusp of uh, of that happening. But yes, that's a, I think that's a really important dynamic. But this idea of isolation, I think, is in, is interesting because if you think of the word isolation or alienated, you usually think of that as a positive thing or a negative thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, we think of that as negative. Like, you're not supposed to feel isolated or alienated. That's usually seen, you know, as a kind of negative, you know, state of being. Um, you know, in the context of the war, our, our, our isolation in the sense um, the fact that you know we're on the North American continent and the war is you know taking place in Europe and in the Pacific, um, you know we have important connections. You know and we're involved in the in the war effort, but they are very far away, um, you know, from us in that respect. So there's a case where you know being isolated in a, you know from the events is you know is certainly to our benefit. So I think that you know the effect affects the way he's thinking. The um, other thing too, and this is something. We'll talk about uh, more, especially as we, we begin to talk about European artists after World War II, is that existentialism is a really um, important philosophical idea. Uh, you know, it's certainly an important philosophy at the time in the post-war period, but existential thinking and existential thought, um, really, it's, its roots are really back in the 19th century, so it's not just like this brand new idea that, you know, pops up out of nowhere. Um, but it's something that people, especially Europeans, more so than Americans, although there's a lot of Americans who are interested in you know, what ex- existentialism is all about, um, that that really develops in this post-war period. And, and, the, and just say, in a nutshell, because again, we'll talk about it in more detail, the idea of existentialism is a sense of alienation, is isolation. Um, and it can be in a negative way, but it can also be seen in a kind of positive way as well, which is something that we'll talk about. So, that way of thinking about being isolated and alienated as a, as a bad thing or a bad psychological state. Um, you know, Greenberg is saying that, you know, maybe this is a good thing. The fact that he talks about it as a natural, you know, condition. Although, at the same time, this is where he seems kind of a little bit wishy-washy because he's talking about the state of how we think about art in the United States, you know, versus other places. And, you know, it it's doesn't, it, you know, it seems less valued isn't that there's, what he's getting at is that there's a significant American art that's coming out of this, you know, dynamic where 
in America where the arts aren't necessarily, um, you know, aren't necessarily uh, really valued. Um, what's something else marked on this page? <coughs> I'm reading it. Yeah, and he says that, in, so if you read, read on further, he says, you know, yet it is precisely our more intimate and habitual acquaintance with, iso- excuse me, with isolation that gives us our advantage at this moment. So he's saying, you know, because of this, you know, this is, we, can, we can work with this. Um, isolation, or rather the alienation that is its cause, is the truth. Isolation, alienation, naked and revealed unto itself is the condition under which the true, true, true reality of our age is experienced. And the, and the experience of this true reality is indis- indispensable to any ambitious art. Um, then in the next paragraph, he talks about um, Paris, right? And remember Paris, you know, up until you know, World War II in, in this post-war period that's shifting to New York. Um, but Paris is the cultural capital in the West um, for the arts. And he begins talking about the dynamic um, in Paris. So he talks about the... You know, literary and art mag- magazines, the quick recognition, you know, that people are aware, you know, of, of the art scene, the tokens of reward, you know, the crowded op- openings. He's basically saying, anyway, the, when you read through that, he's basically saying that those things aren't real. You know, he's interested in this. You can see, you can see what his preferences are. He likes this alienated state, um, you know, rather than the, than the dynamic of, the dynamics of Paris. He's seeing those as maybe being kind of us, you know, in, in, um, in some ways. Um, but he's also, keeping in mind, he's also pushing this idea that American art is where it's at, not the old world, you know, not Paris, but um, American, New York in particular. He does talk a little bit of a crisis. What's the, what is the crisis? Mm-hmm. And it's not when it does, it's not accepted, I guess. Yeah, yeah. He seemed to point out that it was really struggling against the grind. Right, yeah. And so, so these are, these are these ideas, right? You know, isolation, alienation, struggle, you know, struggle against the status quo, as it were. Um, because if you're going against the grain, it means, you know, you're. It, you know, you're against what you know what is considered the norm at the time. And if we think about how we define modern art, especially you know avant art, art you know, modern avant art, art, um, that's one of the definitions of it is that it's art that's sort of ahead of the pack. But and because of that, because it's leading, it's advancing, um, it's often not understood, or it takes some time, you know, for the um, for the work to be understood. Um, and he puts preference, you know, on abstract art, you know, being, you know, the most the most important. Um, and you mentioned the public uh, not accepting it, and he talks about that. He refers to this shrinking appreciation on the public's part. And if we think about, if we think about American art and the trends in American art before uh, World War II, which is something we talked about briefly, it's toward more narrative painting, figurative painting. Um, you know, work that's, you know, more quickly understood, you know, it's representational, you look at it, you realize there are things in there you see, you recognize it's telling you a story, um, you know, whether or not, you know, you know that story, it's functioning in that much more traditional way, and, you know, Greenberg really likes, what really likes abstract painting, right, and he thinks that this is the most important, you know, this kind of work here is the most important work that's being made, and he's, you know, recognizing that the, that the public, um, is not uh, is not necessarily holding on to that. So, what's the solution for the crisis? I mean, you mean framing it as a crisis? How do we? How, do, how does he think we should resolve the crisis? From what I read, it said that he felt that the American public should be more accepting of the abstract art mm-hmm. and completely forget any of its style. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, and, he's, he, and that's exactly it. He says the only solution to the crisis would be an increasing acceptance by the public of advanced painting. Right? He uses that phrase. What he means by advanced painting is that you know he's saying it's the best painting, but notably he's saying it's advanced. You know, it's this progressive painting, um, and at the same time, an increasing rejection of all other kinds. What do you think about that? Do you think that's a good idea, <laughs> or is that possible? I think in order to appreciate any newer art, you have to know about art that's come before 
and it just kind of gives you a basis by which to appreciate everything that comes mm -hmm. out there. Yeah, too, but and that you know, and that you you may be influenced by taking art history classes. <laughs> in that respect, because certainly I agree with that, right? You know, I mean, I just understand, you know, art within its context is important enough to just, you know, throw everything out. And it's sort of impossible to, because you know, we're 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 led to understand that art is this sort of subjective idea. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we define things as either good or bad, but it's all based on personal opinion, and somebody just might not like that style. Mm -hmm. And they might prefer an older style, or yeah, and it's all it oftentimes comes down to how well you argue your yeah. you know, your preference. Yeah, like I mean, a lot of the modern art is very conceptual, mm -hmm. and it's about the idea. And if you don't have any background knowledge on the idea, then you're just like looking at a canvas and a red dot, and you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's and that's the tricky part. There's a there's a I think it's in if I remember correctly, it's in one of the Art Twenty One videos by James Terrell. James Terrell is a Contemporary, it's getting up there in age, but he's a contemporary artist who's um, his. If you're familiar with anything by him, it's the um, it's this, this project he's been working on since the 1970s called Broken Crater. He's considered a land a land art artist, um, but he also does these installations of light, which are kind of amazing because he, he understands his backgrounds in art and perceptual psychology, which is how we kind of make sense of the world and understand the things that we see. And he makes these sculptures that are essentially light, but they look solid, right? So they really kind of play with how you interpret the things that you see in the world. But in that in that segment, he says this thing that I think of, I think of often, and it deals with this issue. He says, you know, one of the problems, and he says problem, but it's not so much that he thinks it's it's a problem, but it's like an issue. Is another word you could use. But one of the issues with contemporary art is you have to step in. You can say for abstract artists, you have to step into the space of that art. Like you have to understand it. And if you're outside of it, then it doesn't have meaning to you, and it's really easy, you know, to dismiss. And I think that's the the root. Um, you know, when you see work, you know, like this, and we think of that, you know, kind of you know, often repeated expression. My five year old could make that. You know. Um, it comes from that, you know, it comes from that feeling. It comes from somebody, you know, who's on the outside who doesn't really understand it, maybe isn't, you know, comparable interest in trying to make sense out of it because they want to look at something and go, oh, that's a picture of a tree in a barn and, uh, you know, or whatever, you know, it might be. It's being, you know, representational. And it's, it's a challenge, you know, it's a, it's a stronger challenge to try to understand, um, you know, uh, work, work like this. That's the last thing that I think. So yeah, so this is what you know. This is what Greenberg is saying essentially is you know the situation at the moment is isolation, alienation. This is what's fueling um, the best start. You know, I didn't ask you this question, but one of the things he says that I think is important also to point out because this also connects to this idea of some of the myths um, of art and artists it's on page one ninety four. Um, where he's talking about where the best art is taking uh, taking place, and, and keeping in mind that in, the, in this time frame of 1948, you know, the, the artists that we think of as famous and you know, whose work is you know in um, significant collections like MoMA, they're just starting to get some attention. Um, he says, you know, what? And this is the top of the page. He says, you know, what is more real at this moment? Or rather, what is more real at this moment is the shabby studio on the fifth floor of a full water walk-up tenement on Hudson Street, the frantic scrabbling for money, the two or three fellow painters who admire you, your work, the neurosis of alienation that makes you such a difficult person to get along with. Uh, the myth that is lived out here is not a new one. It's as old as the Latin Quarter, which is a reference to the, the artist quarter and uh, artist neighborhood, if you want to think of it that way, in Paris. Uh, but I do not think it was ever lived out with so little panache, so few compensations, and so much reality. He uses the word reality in a way that, uh, than, you know, different than usual. Um, the alienation, the alienation of Bohemia was only the anticipation in 19th century Paris. It is in New York that has been completely you know, fulfilled. So what he's saying is that it's so much harder to be an artist in New York, right? Um, you know, the, your living situation is harder, nobody really cares about your work, you know, the people who do, you know, they don't have any money you know, to buy your work, you're in poverty, you know, you're, you're scraping to get by, and you live in a place that doesn't really appreciate art anyway. So at least in Paris, there's this, you know, tradition, this history of, um, you know, and kind of cultural appreciation 
how a bunch of art teaches a different dynamic. So what, what Greenberg is saying in some ways is kind of, a, you know, I feel like it's, it's kind of a, an American attitude, right? You work really hard and you'll succeed. Um, because, and I think that that attitude is sort of under you know that you don't you know doesn't you know you don't but the best artists aren't coming from privilege they're the ones who are going to fight you know and kind of claw their way you know to the top uh, it's that alienation that's going to lead to the best art it's that struggle you know that's going to lead to art how do you feel about those ideas I would argue that that's not necessarily true just because like to use a Hitler tried really, really hard, but they wouldn't accept him into art school. Mm -hmm. And like, he did amazing painting. Yeah, he but shifted gears, didn't he? I thought you were going to put it, you know, it's like a just murder. Yeah. And you know, and that's why he's, and that, and part of the reason that's why they use the term. It's like you know, this mythos or this, you know, this. Uh, mythology, you know, this, we have this, you know, kind of this idea of a rags, you know, rags to riches stories, which, you know, certainly sometimes is true, but, um, you know, not always the case. But I think the fact that, you know, Greenberg's really promoting this idea that these are these tough Americans, you know, living in a tough <coughs> environment, um, and they're going to succeed. And he's really, you know, promoting them. This is, I mean, it's what he wants to happen. Yeah. I feel like he was saying that it's almost necessary have that harsh reality in order to make it Yeah, and I think I think that's certainly a part of it too. It's the, you know from the from the struggle um, is going to come something that's of value, and and I think there is some truth you know to that. Even if you think of it as um, you know just the process of working, I've, I've heard this. I mean, I, I know this to be true in some ways from my own experience, but I've heard. You know, other people put this, or even um, I think, that, you know, I think lots of artists who talk about this was they're developing ideas. The first ideas are rarely the best ones because they're too easy, they're too simple, they're too obvious. It's after you toss out all of the good ones that you really get to the, um, you know, get to the core of it, um, and and that's struggle, you know, because you want to go with the first great ideas, you know, that you're. Most people want to do that, and it's harder, you know, to, to struggle with an idea and try to get to the, um, or the concept or whatever the case may be. Or you make a lot of art, and it's, you know, and then, um, and then try to pull out what is the what is the best, you know, not to kind of um, struggle there. Any other comments or questions before we move forward? Hold on to your papers for now. I'll, if, I'll, at the end of the class, I'll take them um, from you. I'll grab them from you. Um, but remind me too if I seem to not say something about this, because I have a habit of time to it. <laughs> by the time we get there. Um, as I mentioned last week, we like this idea of struggle a little bit, maybe, because um, as we talk about Pollock's work in this time frame, in kind of the you know, early mid 40s to late 40s, uh, he's an artist who's still, you know, developing. Is still, you know, he's certainly, you know, still struggling. <coughs> and when we left off last time, we, we hadn't actually gotten to this, but um, I just sort of introduced it. That in 1947, he applied for a Guggenheim uh, fellowship. So, uh, you know, these are kind of things that I think we're pretty familiar with today. That uh, felt, any, you know, any kind of a fellowship, oftentimes, or even a, a, an art award. There's certain kinds of art awards that function in a similar way. Is what you're applying for is basically some money um, that you can use to make art, and it might be that you need to buy materials or pay the rent or whatever the case may be. But that this, this application or the Guggenheim Fellowship is basically a monetary award that is going to fund you to, to keep making artwork, um, and also it's a networking tool. It's going to help you to get attention. So this is uh, this is from his application. This is what he said in 1947 that he was going to do. He says, I intend to paint large movable pictures which will function between the easel and the mural. And it's also illustrating how he's thinking about this, um, you know, this kind of the differences between, an, and again, an easel painting refers to a painting like, you know, um, you know, can, you know canvas, you know, stretched canvas, something like that. Um, even if it's really big and wouldn't sit on an easel, you could still refer to it as an easel painting. It's something you'd hang up, you know, on the wall uh, versus a mural, which we think of as being a part of the wall or attached to the wall itself. So he says, I intend to paint large movable pictures which will function between the easel and mural. I've set a precedent in this genre and a large painting from Miss Peggy Guggenheim 
which was installed in her house and was later, later shown at the large-scale painting show at the Museum of Modern Art. It is at present at Yale University. So, and this even today is probably, you know, good advice for writing, you know, fellowships or writing applications, and that's, you know, name drop and point things out, <laughs> you know, so he, he makes connections to Miss Peggy Guggenheim, who's the niece of the person who founded the Guggenheim Museum, uh, that's, you know, hosting the fellowship, and he's pointing out, you know, my work has been shown as, you know, in significant places, and it's, you know, part of the, you know, part of the university, so, um, he's, he's at this point you know, got some, got some uh, connections or has some uh, significance. Uh, he says, I believe the easel picture to be a dying form, and the tendency of modern feeling is towards the wall picture or mural. I believe the time is not yet ripe for a full transition from easel to mural. The pictures I contemplate making would constitute a halfway stay, an attempt to point out the direction of the future without arriving there. Um, and this, I think, this part I think is really interesting too. Is he's basically saying there's this thing that's on the way out. There's this new thing that's coming. I'm not going to tell you that I am fully going to resolve this issue, um, but I'm going to work toward that point. And that's a that's a really effective um, proposition in a, in a lot of ways. Um, that you're not going to answer the question, right? But you're going to do the research, and in a sense, you're going to you know, see what you can. You know, see what you can um, certainly find out. So what he's talking about is there's you know there's these big changes you know that are happening, and, and he's also trying to um, you know present himself as as being relevant um, in this respect. And what he's talking about here, notably, are also the same ideas that um, Greenberg is, is talking about. That he thinks you know certainly the best art is abstract, but he also thinks, and I'll come back to this um, essay. He also thinks that the best art is big, and that you know easel paintings are also dying out as well. And notably, you know this is, you know Pollux is written in 1947. This is published in 1948. Um, but you kind of get the sense they've been talking about these things. Hey, so where did I put it? No, where is it marked here? Yeah, he says this is on page um, 195. Um, find it here. Yeah, he says, abstract painting being flat needs a greater extension of, of surface on which to develop its ideas than the old three-dimensional easel painting. So what he's saying is that abstract painting, you know, doesn't have, doesn't create this illusion of the three-dimensional world, uh, you know, in a traditional sense. And because of that, it needs to be bigger, right? That's what it means by a greater extension of surface. It functions best, you know, on a, on a large scale because it's not creating the illusion of the three-dimensional world. And he says it seems to become trivial when confined with anything measuring less than two feet by two, which I think is actually kind of, kind of small. Um, and, and then he also goes on to talk about this, you know, and then he goes on to talk about the paradox uh, with the public. But um, even here, I think there's another point in here. Um, oh, actually, it's before that part on page 194. Um, he says there is a persistent urge to go beyond the cabinet picture which is destined to occupy only a spot on the wall, right? To a kind of picture that without actually becoming identified with the wall like a mural, would spread over it and acknowledge its you know, physical reality. So, um, you know, so really clearly Greenberg and Pollock are on, you know, they're on board in this time frame. They're thinking um, about the same things. Greenberg's writing about these ideas and Pollock's you know, applying for fellowships and creating work, which is also um, emphasizing these ideas that paintings need to go big, they need to go abstract. Uh, and, you know, in this in this respect, this is a transitional time period, and Pollock's trying to you know demonstrate that um, you know he's the he's the artist uh, of, of his time. He's the artist who's representing um, this change or this, uh, this new dynamic. This is a, a painting that is in 1948. This is one of the the first of the paintings that Greenberg referred to as the all over paintings. And, um, we, and again, we could talk. We could refer to this as action painting or gestural abstraction. You could use you know, Greenberg's you know, phrasing of all over painting as well. And what we're seeing, what he means by that, or what Greenberg meant by that, is um, Pollock's literally painting all over the, the surface. He's still at this point. He, he kind of leaves an edge or a border. The way he's working on these is the the canvas it, it, when he's painting is not stretched. Um, it's on the floor, so rather than being stretched on a frame and hanging on the wall in front of it, he has a, you know, and this is what he's sort of famous for, 
Um, you know, he's got it on the floor. He's moving around the edges, and he's guiding and dripping paint on that surface. And you get a sense of that, because you can sort of imagine that he's standing around the edges, you know, leaning over into it and kind of, you know, spreading and, and uh, dripping the paint, um, you know, onto that surface. And again, when you look at this work in reproduction, it tends to look really flat and graphic. When you see works like these in person, there is a, a kind of strange depth to them. They look more web-like. And there's, a, there's maybe one way of thinking about it. Um, the other thing in terms of the material that he's using is he's working with what we would think of today as latex house, house paint, um, which is a you know, sort of it's commercial paint, not necessarily just uh, you know, designed for artists or industrial paint. Is another way of thinking about it, and it's something that was initially developed in the 1930s, so it's you know relatively new um, kind of paint. Part of the reason why he's using it has to do with its viscosity. You know, if you think of the, the texture of house paint, you know, it's it's thick and it's thick and thin at the same time, especially compared to you know, traditional you know, oil paint. If you want to compare one to the other, it's not thick and has to be you know, thinned down uh, with turpentine or mineral spirits. It has this kind of stretchy viscosity um, to it. And so he's taking advantage of that material. He's also doing something that's really you know typically associated with modernists and modernism. And that's to um, kind of to push for like new new modes and new forms of expression. So he's using he's working as paint, but he's using an, an, an unusual material or an unusual uh, type of paint, taking something it's like an industrial or commercial process and and um, you know bringing it into the to an artist's um, context. The uh, the other thing about this work too is if you look really carefully. In the, I think you, it's, in, it's in other areas, but you can see it most clearly here. Really carefully, what do you see there? Can you make that out? Handprints. Yeah, there's handprints, right? So you see, you know, you're seeing these dripped, you know, kind of guided and dripped lines. When you look carefully, you're literally seeing the hand of the artist or the mark of the artist. This is something that disappears in as you as you watch this run of paintings that he makes, or think of it as a body of work. Those handprints disappear. You'll see um, other elements of his presence, thing, and, and famously, there's one painting in which um, there's a, there was a cigarette butt stuck, you know, within the layers of paint. Um, but apparently, he was, I don't know whether he dropped it in there intentionally or fell out of his mouth, you know, while he was painting. Um, and it was in, it's literally like caught, in, it like obviously fell in and he painted over the surface of it because of the paint dry, you know, it held it, um, it held it in place. And part of the reason why I mentioned that is because there was some discussion and this has been quite a while ago now, probably like um, maybe 15, going on 20 years, but it's, it was one of the paintings in Moma's collection, and the, it, so it's like a butt of a cigarette, and it fell out of the painting. And so there was this discussion among the curators. And the reason I know this is that I had a, somebody I um, worked with, or knew in a university context, knew one of the curators at Moma and, and had heard about this discussion you know, via that person. Uh, but the curators had this discussion about what do they do, right? Um, because the, the cigarette butt basically was falling apart, and it was breaking down. So, like, you know, do we just let it fall out and leave it that way? Did we put another one in there? Uh, it was a Marlboro cigarette, so it was a product you know, still available and very similar today. And in the end, they decided to insert a new, you know, cigarette butt in there. And so one of the curators apparently, they, took, they voted, I think, of who, who would get smoked a cigarette, and they smoked it down and inserted it back into the painting. <laughs> so these are crazy things that you know, curators you know, have, to, have to deal with. Uh, yeah, so une unexpected decisions. Um, so it's an original, like, in a box somewhere? I wonder, right? You know, I wouldn't be surprised, you know. Did you hear about what happened? You know, I mean, telling that story made me think about, do you all know about the King Tut's mask? Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, so these are, that's just great. So somebody oh. like did something bad and was like, oh, crap, and tried to fix it, and then the end is a much, uh, much, much better. Do you know the whole, like, the whole story, what happened? It's going to come out. I don't know the whole story. Basically, do you know it? I'm curious. What curious happened was... Um, this is totally <clears throat> nothing to do with Jack and Paul, but, <laughs> but were, it's interesting. They were doing a routine cleaning mm -hmm. of the mask, and whoever was handling it dropped it. Oh, and is that where it chin chooses? broke off. Yeah. So... The, instead of following protocol and reporting it to the, the board it's of the exactly restoration committee, yeah. um, they went straight to this lady who worked in the restoration committee, and she, her husband worked with, in the restoration committee too, and 
uh, she decided to get him to come in and just fix it, mm -hmm. and he thought it was a great idea to try to be a handyman and use epoxy to fix it. Yeah, and see, I knew they used epoxy, which is which just, is permanent and yeah. damaging. Yeah, because and, it's a chemical um, bond. <clears throat> what ended up happening was, of course, he put too much epoxy mm -hmm. on it, and it also uh, photographs I've seen. You can see where they tried to like scrape yeah, it off, he, where it was oozing out. Yeah, he got so. it on the on parts of the face, and they mm -hmm. tried to use a something to scratch it off, and uh, it, it was just all. Because, you can imagine, like you, know, you sort of imagine yeah. that moment, right, of like one thing becoming worse yeah. you know, on top of the other. And it's a really good. And this is my spin on it. It's a really good example of why when something bad happens, you shouldn't try to hide it. Have you, you know, seen like the you should, like yeah, yeah. It's really bad. It looks bad. It's, it's, it looks, yeah. yeah. And you know, you just you know explain what happened, do it because because covering it up makes the situation much much worse. And the thing about conservation, you, you know, when you look at um, especially we can I can't swing this back to an artistic kind of thing, um, is that when you look, oftentimes it'll come up. You know, in, say in say an art history class, you'll be reading about something you know from the you know either faraway past or more recent past, and there'll be a discussion of you know damage that has been done from you know previous restorations or. There's a current restoration to try and you know correct um, you know previous restoration. It's because in the in the past um, people often did things that looked good in the you know in the moment, but caused damage over time. So they may have put a layer of varnish on a painting. That's a really common thing. Um, was that you know uh, whoever owned a painting would put a layer of varnish on it because it would make the image look clearer and more and the colors more vibrant for a while, but then what would happen across you know, decades and hundreds of years is then the varnish darkens, and so then you get the you know, exact problem, and, and potentially you can have another group of people who come in and try to fix it again, so you have you know, these repeated fixes that cause damage. So the, the, you know, the standard practice for conservators today and, and art restorers is that you really have to understand the chemical composition of whatever it is that you're using. You have to understand how it's going to react to whatever material it is that you're working with, whatever it's made out of. And you always want to try to use, or not try to, but always use materials that are reversible, um, which means that you can take it off later if you need to, that they're going to interact. And it's one of the reasons why um, conservation and restoration commonly, it, it, there are programs, and I'll mention this too because these are you know, careers in, in art-related fields, is that um, they either require you have a, de a degree in chemistry and a degree in art history, usually combined, and then go into a program, or they essentially teach art history and chemistry, you know, kind of side by side, because you have to be really knowledgeable in both to understand um, all of the issues. One is the physical issues, and the other is the, you know, kind of art, you know, historical um, context of the work. So, yeah, so that's a, that's a crazy, you know, story, and really a shame, because of all of the Egyptian art in the world, that, of ancient Egyptian art that exists, that is probably the most recognized, you know, object. And I think if you, I mean, you just say King Tut, and you know, most people have some, you know, understanding of what that is, and they probably their visual of that is probably that mask, you know, that particular one. So it's crazy, yeah. And being a curator, you get these strange, you know, decisions as to what do we do about the cigarette, right? Do we just smoke it, stick it back in there, or? You know, it's not the real thing. And it's an issue that also, as we'll see as we move forward in time, in this class, um, especially as we get into the 1960s and beyond the 1960s, there's a lot of art that's not that's produced that's not archival. And in some cases, was never meant to be archival, um, but yet we're compelled to preserve it, um, you know, to preserve you know, the objects. And so um, that's a real challenge, you know, for curators and collectors. Um, too. So there's several notable pieces that we'll, we'll talk about um, along the way as we, as we move forward in time. Um, but interesting, I said forward in time because in, in talking about the handprints on there, it also tends to make me go back in time as well. When I see these handprints, you have the hand of the artist, the mark of the artist, which is actually something um, you know that we associate, that we, if we think about it conceptually, we associate the hand of the artist with like a signature style. We even use that phrase in signature style, that you know, everybody's signature is you know, different. Um, you know, the way our handwriting is something that's really intrinsic to ourselves, right? It's very, you know, not special. And when you look at even the history of, you know, of art, really kind of the history of art history, um, art historians, connoisseurs in particular, study <coughs> mark making. They study the, the way that artists make marks, the way they say for painting, the way they apply paint. And they can tell, you know, this is definitely by this artist or maybe it's by 
uh, somebody you know, copying that artist or student or something like that because of that signature mark. So notably, there, there are no brush strokes in this painting, right? And that's what um, you know, art historians and connoisseurs generally are looking for, but we're seeing are these drips of paint. You know, obviously, you know, they're made by you know, Pollock guiding the paint onto the surface, but we don't see that characteristic brush mark. But he does put his hand front. For me, and this is you know, my take on the painting, when I, when I see this in this work, I think about cave paintings, which is, is, is you know, and I don't know, if, I'm not sure if this is necessarily a good way of thinking about it, but I think it's interesting that, you know, this contemporary artist in the late 1940s, you know, he's pushing boundaries, he's pushing the edges, he's got the support of, you know, a major critic like Greenberg behind him, you know, he's trying to push art into this new territory, but to me, those handprints seem really archaic, right? There's this um, kind of reference to the past, and we also know, we talked about this last time, we also know that Pollock is um, interested in Jungian psychology. He's undergoing analysis. There's this idea of archetypes, um, that there are these you know, concepts, these um, types, you know, whether they're, um, they're sort of conceptual types or ideas, concepts, is one way of thinking about them, that cross time, that come from the very deep past, but still affect us in the present. And in a sense, I feel like this archetype, this handprint, is a kind of archetype. When we think of a handprint, we associate it with an individual, certainly. Um, you know, maybe it's a, a mark of ownership, or it's even just as simple as I was here. You know, kind of mark. It could really mean a lot of things. And, um, you know, handprints are something that we, or rather, that we commonly find in, the, in prehistoric cave things as well. What they mean, you know, is open um, for interpretation. We don't necessarily know, but you know, culturally, we associate a handprint with a lot of things. So, um, so part of the reason for mentioning this too is that even though Pollock is um, moving ahead with this new kind of painting, you know, that we talk about as action painting or all over painting, in this work, this work is still really kind of transitional. Um, because he's still kind of linking um, back to that work that he was doing in the earlier. Uh, kind of early to mid 1940s, where we see these archetypal forms, you know, like the guardians of the secret, and those, um, those kind of images. Yeah, question. Um, I had a couple questions about the number one egg piece. Mm -hmm. it, the background is that the actual color of the canvas? Yeah, it's, the, it's yeah, it's the canvas. It's un, it's unprimed canvas. And is that his signature Tanisha Bowen? It is, which you see here, which does, which he doesn't always. And the other thing, to the fact that he puts the signature on there is interesting too. That's something that also drops off in some of the later paintings. Uh, and it also interesting, and this is an interesting point too for this painting here, because the signature's there, we know to orient it. Like we know that this that there's a top and a bottom and a left and a right. That's something that's typical that he's looking for, right? Because you're going to put it on the wall or hang it on the canvas. When we get to our, I think it might be this image. Here, and we get to number 30, uh, Autumn Rhythm, done a little bit later. Um, there's no signature, you know, it's at least on the, on the front. Some of his paintings have signatures on the back, um, some of them don't. And that's why uh, so, several years ago there was somebody who bought a, I think there's a documentary about it that I haven't seen yet, but there was somebody who found, we're almost out of time. Um, <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Give me 30 seconds. <laughs> Um, somebody found a painting like at a thrift store or a garage sale. They really felt like it was a Pollock painting that's not signed, but it looked like Pollock, could be a knockoff. And the you know, connoisseurs and curators and art, and art historians are kind of split. A lot of them think it's a Pollock and a lot of them aren't sure. But the reason they're not sure is because when he goes into this run, and again it goes fully into it, um, he's not putting those identifying marks. And it's unclear even what's top, what's bottom, you know, what's left and right. And Paul kind of liked it that way. And that's that's what we'll talk about a little bit more um, next time. So we're out of time for today. Uh, be aware, I've put something up on the blog.